I'm going to be taking my text from Esther chapter 4, and we're going to read verse 13. If you don't mind to stand for the reading of the word. Esther chapter 4 and verse 13. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So I'm going to entitle this message, You Have Been Called. For such a time Amen. as this. Amen. Would you please bless the word? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. It's anointed from the time it was penned to this present day. Lord, we also thank you for your handmaiden, Lord, that's coming here today with a word from your throne. Lord, anoint your mouthpiece. Lord, anoint our ears to hear and understand what your spirit's going to say through her to this church. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Y'all may be seated. Amen. What is one of the number one things that you can think of? And and don't be shy. Go ahead and blurt it on out right when I ask this question. Um, Don't hold back. First thing that pops in your mind. What is the number one thing that holds you back from doing something you really would want to do and really be passionate about, but you don't do it? What is one of the reasons... That will hold you back. Just spurt it out. Procrastination, fear, insecurities. Was there anything else? Those are the primary ones. Yes. Myself. Ourself. Sometimes our own desires and the way we think something should look and the way circumstances should look and appear and be before we do something is also... um, Holding us back from doing what we're called to do or doing what we think we want to do. Sometimes in our flesh, we think things have to be a certain way, look a certain way, or we have to get a certain amount of education. Or we rely on our abilities and we rely on on others here on this earth to piece everything together so perfectly. And then, okay, everything looks safe and nice now. Now I'll jump in and get my feet wet. And that's what Pastor was talking about today. I mean, you just got to say yes. You know, and at first... We may flubber up. I mean, there were times I'd sing songs in the wrong key. Or I, when I really started, I would play with the hymn in my skirt and pull it up over my head. And, I mean, <laughs> you know, but I said yes. Thank you, Jesus. And when it comes to preaching the word of God, I didn't know what God had for me to speak to y'all today. But pastor was like, look, I need you. And, and I didn't know what I was going to say. I didn't know how my day was going to go today, but I just, I said yes. Mm -hmm. And that's all I know that I need to do. That's right. Is to say yes. That's right. And I have confidence that God shows up through me and speaks through me. Yes. It's him. It's not me. That's right. And I have gotten to a place in my walk with God where I've gained confidence in that. Amen. Now I know that I need to study to show myself approved so that when the Holy Spirit moves upon me, he can pull that knowledge. Right. And there might be something I might try to remember, can't remember, can't remember. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, oh, it'll just come to me. That's the Holy Spirit. Yes. God knows what he's doing and he will orchestrate everything the way that he wants it orchestrated. Thank you, Lord. But sometimes within our own self, We want to take things into our own control. We want to just make things happen the way we want them to happen or the way we think they should. Right. Our plan is rarely ever God's plan. Right. And that's hard to accept because we think we know what's best for us. Well, no one knows how I feel. No one knows what I've been through. Well, you know, yes, he does. He knew before you knew. Right. And he has predestined because he foreknows. So there is no passion or desire that he has placed in you that he knows you cannot fulfill. But we have to put ourselves in a certain position for him to fulfill that will. And when we are fighting against it because we think things need to look the way we think they need to look, we procrastinate the will of God. 
Another thing that we do with fear, I think fear is the number one reason why we don't do something. And one of the things is because we rely on our own abilities too much. Right. I have to be perfect. I have to, you know, and not to not the Catholic Church today, but I'm sorry, you cannot be good enough ever to enter into the kingdom of All God. Right. That's what Calvary's for. All right. There is only one person that was perfect and that was Jesus Christ and he was the spotless lamb and our faith in him and our going down in that precious name and identifying with that sacrifice and killing our old man that is what brings us salvation and we must continue to crucify the flesh daily it doesn't mean I have to Say so many prayers or do so many good deeds. Nothing breaks my heart more. And I have friends and family that is very close to me that I love dearly that have loved ones that have passed on. And they think that they have to do something to to be able to earn God's love so they can get their loved ones out of purgatory. I'm sorry, but I wouldn't serve that kind of God. Come on. He himself came because he loved me just like you would for your children. Or someone you love. You wouldn't look at your child and say, well, you need to be good enough first before I I can love you or bless you or lead you into the calling of your life. He said, I've come to to fulfill that for you and your faith in me and what I'm doing in your life and how I'm transforming your life and how I'm giving you the power to kill and crucify that flesh daily. That is what is going to bring you into the will of God. So if you have a passion If you feel that there's just things that you think about so much that it consumes all of your time and you want to succeed in that so much, God placed that there. So don't doubt yourself or think that you're not capable of ever reaching it. I don't care if it's, you know, going to the moon and, and you building the craft to do it. If God's laid that on your heart, it's because he has started something in you to fulfill his will. Amen. And also, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but it's very rarely about you. All right. This life is about all of God's children. And when we decide to submit ourselves to God for him to use us, we're doing that because there are others that he loves. And he needs you to help him bring them into the house of God, to bring them into the kingdom. So it's not about you. Thank you, Lord. Not once you've given your life to the Lord. It's not about how I can build up my kingdom, my ministry, you, my Jesus. calling. But it's like, God, what do I have that you have chosen me right. to fulfill, to help build your kingdom? Amen. That's what it's about. And there are many women and men in the word of God that have done great things and that God has called to do great Thank things Jesus. that were not perfect. All right. By any means. And there's a few of them that I just want to talk about today. What will your story say about you? When we've passed on and we sang some of the songs today, you know, when when this life is over and, and, you know, I lay I lay down, close my eyes for the last time. For eternity, what will people remember about you? Mm. It shouldn't be that you had the nicest clothes or the nicest car, a lot of money. It should be, man, they never stopped talking about God, did they? (laughs) Let everything that I do point people to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But to do that, we need to be seekers of God's presence. Yes. We need to dwell in his presence, reminisce in his presence. And pastor is right. Sometimes we have to push past our carnal being because we're we're a fleshly creature. And it's very easy for our flesh to be stronger than our spirit. We live in our flesh every day. So it's easy for us to just be lazy and and not try and just, you know, kind of hum through the prayer and the worship. But if you truly have a hunger to please God. You are going to press in and you are going to seek him. God, speak to me. Show me what it is in my life I need to crucify today. What is it in my life that I'm putting before you? What am I sending you the message that is more important than you are to me? And if that pricks you anywhere in your heart, crucify it. Speedily. Because that is going to keep you distanced from the presence of God. 
What fellowship does light have with darkness? Yes. And as long as you are being selfish, God will not be able to use you to the ability that he is wanting to use you. So I want us to turn to Exodus. And I'm going to speak to you about a man called Moses. In Exodus chapter 33 and verse 12. Let me tell you a little bit about Moses first. Moses was not perfect. I would imagine that he had some mommy issues. And maybe even some daddy issues. In his mind, growing up, he was abandoned by his mother. Who knows what story they told him. Even though she was one that nurtured him and took care of him, she still gave him up into the arms of the enemy. Of course, she had her reasons. But think about it. He's a man. He's a human being, just like you are. And I'm sure he dealt with insecurities about being loved, being wanted, or, or what God wants for me. But the fact is, is he had to be a man that fell in love with God enough to press past all that victim mindset right. and to move forward in the calling that God has given him. He stuttered. He had issues with speaking. He had anger issues. He acted in anger and killed a man. Right. Think about it. He wasn't perfect. And then he fled from his problem. He ran. Right. Right. He wasn't perfect. So some of the things we speculate on what he might have had issues with, but others are pretty clear. He's human. But when God began to call him and woo him, he had a heart to press in. Thank you, Lord. And he was afraid. You're going to send me to do what? Well, what am I going to say? Mm-hmm. He was relying on his own abilities. And God had to quiet that fear in him mm-hmm. so that God could be able to use him in the way that he wants to use him. So Moses would pray and seek God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Just speak for me, Lord, when I go. I'll be obedient. I'll do it because I love you and I'm pressing into you. He gave Moses a compassion and a love for his people. He gave him a pastor's heart to leave the 99, to leave his safety, to leave his comfort zone and to go out and to bring forth his people. In In chapter 33 of Exodus in verse 12, Then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. I can't do it on my own, Jesus. I I, see it didn't look clear to him. It wasn't looking the way he thought it needed to look for him to be able to win this battle in his mind. Oh, we're going to war. Who's going with me? Mm -hmm. So things didn't look the way he thought they needed to look. So he's like questioning God. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know. He's pressing in. You, so that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. He had to seek God's presence. He had to beseech God to be in his will. Show me your grace. Let my heart be burdened for what your burdens. Let me love what you love. And God said that he would go with him. What better company to have than that? So someone who was not perfect, someone who thought things needed to look a certain way before they could take action, God gave him peace because he pressed in and he sought God. Someone else we read about that isn't perfect but was also a great man was David. David's kind of my favorite. I have a heart for David. I, I love him and I can't wait to see him and just let him know what an encouragement he's been to my life. Right. David wasn't perfect. In 2 Samuel, we read about how David was a murderer, fornicator, a liar. But in 2 Samuel, we see God looking at this man and saying, there's a man after my heart. Right. What? 
He legit planned a murder to cover up his sin. But God said he's a man after my heart. Why? Because when he committed those sins and realized what he had done wrong, he sought the presence of God. He sought God in prayer. He repented of what he had done. He was sorry and he changed. He sings about it in the Psalms where he writes of his misery and his sorrows and the battles that he has faced. But then by the end of every Psalm that he has written, he is rejoicing and praising God because he knew it was better to be in God's presence than to have anything this world could offer. He sought God. He hungered for God. He worshipped as we heard about in Bible study a few weeks ago. He worshipped God so much. All his clothes fell off. (laughs) And his wife is looking from the window, embarrassed, ashamed. But do you think that phased David? When he walked into his home to greet his wife, instead she greets him with shame on you. And he's just like, woman, you ain't seen nothing yet. That hit home with me. Are you seeking God's presence in your life? Are are you ashamed of praying in public? Are you ashamed of being considered to be a Jesus freak? Because I can tell you right now, David is probably the first one of them all to really make a (laughs) spectacle of himself. But he didn't care because all he cared about was pleasing God. To be in his presence, to have his favor. There is nothing else on this earth that we need to be seeking more than God's favor. Thank you, Jesus. Job, look at what he went through. And his wife looks at him and says, just curse God and die. Just be done with it. Mm -hmm. He knows where his hope lies. He had lost everything. Can you imagine losing your children, your home, your business, and then getting cursed with diseases on your skin? We would all probably think God had abandoned us too. So she was like, just curse God and die. He he has no favor with you anymore. But he said, the Lord gives. And the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Now many of us have seen far less hardships than Job. Mm -hmm. And we can't bring ourselves to praise God through it. All right. But we want to remain in a victim mindset and feel sorry for ourselves and get attention from others so that they'll feel sorry for ourselves. If your circumstance isn't changing, I'm sorry. It's your fault. It's not God's. If you are in the same situation as you were years ago, not moving forward in ministry, not seeing blessings financially, not seeing God give you peace amidst your hell that you might be experiencing in that moment then it's on you. Because God has given us everything to remain in his favor. It's us that removes ourselves from his favor when we sin. And these men, you've you've seen this with David, he would sin, he would make a mistake, or we question God sometimes and we delay and we procrastinate his will because we think things don't look the way that they need to look. Fear, fear, fear. Acting on fear just gets us in more and more trouble and delays the will of God in your life. I don't want to delay God's will in my life. And I don't care how many times I might mess up or quote the wrong scripture or say it's the wrong person in the Bible. I'm going to keep going until I get it right. And I know that people who really love God will show grace and show mercy in that. Mm -hmm. I had to start sometime. And no, I wasn't perfect when I started. And I still have a lot of room for growth. But I know one thing about me and my ministry. I'm a God seeker. I press in. I press in and then I press in some more Mm -hmm. because I know that if I don't, there's no more hope. I've lost it. I've lost everything. He is my hope. And I know that if I stay under his umbrella, that I will always be in his favor. But if I allow sin in my life, if I choose fear, if I don't live in his will, I remove those blessings from my life. So it's no one's fault but my own. Someone else that I admire in the Bible, too, is Peter. Peter had anger issues, especially when it came to wanting to hurt someone he loved. 
That man rose up, drew his sword, chopped the man's ear off that was trying to take Jesus. Don't you take the man that I love. I can see us all kind of being like that, especially when it comes to people we love and our children. Mama Bear comes out in me a lot for far less. And I have to tell Mama Bear to calm down. Calm down, Chantel. Kids can learn from this. But Peter also made another huge mistake. He denied Christ three times. Mm -hmm. Why? Selfishness. When it boils down to it, fear. Fear of being killed. You don't want to die. If if they find out I'm associated with Christ, they're going to kill me. But there were people in the crowd that saw him. They're like, we know you. You're you're one of the 12. You're, You're one that follows Jesus. No, I'm not. I don't know what you're talking about. Not one. And another person comes up, says, questions him. I know you. You're, you're Peter. No, I'm not. Twice. Now, I would kind of think after the first time I caught myself denying Christ, I'd check myself pretty quick. Mm-hmm. But no, three times. Three. Who was Peter loving more, God or himself? Fear. Fear of what he might lose. Fear of what might happen to him. Did he love Christ? Of course. And God loved him so much that even though Peter did these wrongs and was sorry for it, of course, he was still given the keys to the kingdom. He was the first to preach to the world. He was put in a position on the day of Pentecost to be the first to preach to To the world. And he denied Christ three times. Mm -hmm. But he did have to come to a place of repentance. And submission. For God to be able to allow him to move forward in his destiny. In his calling. You can't continue in sin. and And see blessings from God. You can't continue to live in fear of the unknown. And think things have to look a certain way. And expect to receive the blessings from God. Do things in wisdom. Seek God's will. Press into his presence. And there is peace in his presence. Amen. Amen. Another thing that impresses me with Peter. Is a story that my father would use when he was preaching. But it comes with about being in the presence of God. For me anyway. Um. John and Peter had heard that Christ had arisen and he wasn't in the tomb. He's like, he's not there. His body's not there. They're like, what? What? They loved Christ. Okay, they loved him. So John and Peter both started running to the tomb to see it for themselves. They both run. And of course, Peter's older than John. So John outruns Peter, has more stamina, gets to the tomb first, stops at the door, looks in. But Peter... Peter didn't stop at the door. He ran all the way inside. Mm -hmm. Seeking the presence of God. And because he pressed in, he went just a little further. He received a revelation of God's return. A message my father used to call the folded napkin. He saw something, witnessed something in that tomb. was a message, I'm coming back. I'll be back. If he had not run in there, he would not have received that comfort, that peace, that confidence to continue onward. He probably would have got angry. He's like, what have you done with my Lord? Give me his body. He would have been getting angry with everyone else. But because he ran all the way in, he received a truth. And that truth propelled him into his calling. Now I'm going to bring you all back to Esther. I admire her. She had to keep her identity a secret from the king. She was an orphan. It doesn't really go into detail about how our parents died, but she was living with her uncle Mordecai. He was taking care of her. He was raising her, and he gave her a name of Esther. Her real name was Hadassah, but he was protecting their identity as Jews. And, of course, when King Azarias, 
His wife embarrassed him in front of all of his men. He put her away and wanted to take a new wife. So long story short, they brought all the virgins from the town, the city, the kingdom they were in, and were put under the direction of a servant of the king called Haggai. And Haggai, Esther found favor with Haggai. It's just something about her that's different. Well, I can tell you right now what it was. It's favor with God. So he prepped all of the the virgins, but with her, he kind of coached a little bit, a little bit better than the other virgins because they were each going to have their turn before the king. And then the king was going to choose a new queen. But Haggai, Esther just pricked his heart for some reason. So he told her, when you go before the king, he's going to offer you gifts. You can choose all the gifts that you want. But I want you just to choose this one thing. The scripture tells us he directed her to just choose one specific thing. Doesn't go into detail about what that was. But whatever it was, it impressed the king. And she found favor with the king. I like to think of Haggai kind of like the Holy Spirit prepping us and giving us courage and giving us strength and giving us direction. Like when we're about to do something we shouldn't do or say something where we shouldn't say, and, you know, and it's not a good thing. The Holy Spirit would be like, uh-uh. And the Holy Spirit would like say this instead. But to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit guide you into your calling, you have to first submit yourself to the Holy Spirit. Um, Esther had to submit herself to Haggai. She had to have faith in the direction that he was giving her. And I'm sure her mind was filled with lots of things. Am I going to like the king? Am I not going to like the king? You know, I don't know if I want this. But yet she knew she needed to submit and find favor. And she did. So when she went before the king, a time came where Mordecai was pacing in front of the palace doors daily to hear a report of Esther and how she was doing, how things were going. And he sent a message to her about what was happening to the Jews and that there was a big war coming and that all the Jews were going to be killed. So he says, he sends a message to her. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all of the other Jews. So she was a Jew. She was hiding her identity. And he's like, look, you can remain silent if you want. You can act in fear, live in fear if you want. Go ahead. It's your choice. But if you do. You will perish and all of your household with you. And God will just choose someone else to do his will and raise his people up. I don't know about you, but I would want to fulfill my calling in my life for the kingdom. Why? Because I am truly in love with my creator. More and more. Every year that passes, I fall in a deeper love with my creator, my God, who designed me for a specific purpose. And if I don't fulfill that purpose, I have failed. And if I fail me, I fail my children and I fail their children and their children's children. Because I didn't submit myself to the call and to the will of God's life for me. So yes, fear might want to creep over me and say, Chantel, you can't do this. You can't teach tomorrow. You don't even know what you're going to teach. You don't even know what you're going to say. You're not educated enough comparing yourself to other people. But I just say yes. And then I'll let God do the rest. I press in. I seek his presence. What do you want to say? What do you want? What is the message you want to relay? And just flow through me. Use me. Right. This message is for you today. Esther showed much bravery. Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, verse 16. Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Have you asked people to pray for you? I would think she really needed it. She was put in a pickle. Go before the king and ask for mercy for her people or remain silent and all of them perish. Was she going to be selfish? She's like, I need some prayer. I know when I need prayer, 
I'll go to my sisters in the Lord, my family, my friends. Like, look, y'all, I'm going through something, and I know I can trust you guys, so here's what's going on, and I need y'all to pray for me. We need to lean on each other. She said, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. So she wasn't asking, A, of anyone something she wasn't willing to do herself. If you're not willing to fast and pray for yourself about something, don't go asking other people to pray for you. All right. If you don't have what it takes to seek God, the will for your life and deliverance from whatever you're battling, you can't go asking other people to pray for you. Because who does God want to speak to the most about your situation? Someone else or you? So you need to be seeking and pressing into God, seeking his presence, find his favor, and allow the Holy Spirit to move freely. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, because she knows if she goes before the king when she's not summoned, she's going to be killed. And if I perish, I perish. Now to me, she was putting fear aside. Or else she wouldn't have even said, and if I perish. So of course she was afraid. But she had to be willing to submit her will, just like Christ did in the garden. Christ didn't want to suffer. He didn't want to go through all of that pain. But yet he said, not my will, but thine be done. What are you willing to go through to fulfill God's calling in your life? What are you willing to? To give up, what are you willing to go through? What embarrassment or fear or losing a job or losing a boyfriend or girlfriend or even sometimes your own children, your own family can turn from you because God's calling you to live greater. He sees more in you than what you are allowing yourself to see. And don't lie for a minute and tell yourself that you don't see it in you. You do. You do. You see the calling in your life. But you suppress it and you hush it and you quiet it. We're a three-part being. Your body. Everyone, touch your body. We're body, right? You only got one of those. And you're a soul. Everyone place your hand over the forefront of your head right here. Your soul is your character, your humor, your silliness as I look at these children. It's your character. It's who you are. Your talents. God designed you in your mother's womb with specific detail and thought and plan in mind. So, okay, Chantel, what's the third part? It's your spirit. Now, I would like you to think of a plant that's planted in soil. The roots are in the soil, covered up really good, and you leave the plant there. What are some things that that plant needs? Water. Water. Sun. Sun. Soil. Makes the soil. Nutrients. Light. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if that plant never got those things, what's going to happen to it? It dies. Have you ever seen a really shriveled up, withered plant? Yeah. Now I want you to look inside your soul. You've got your body. I think most of you here, by the looks of it, treat your body pretty well. Get enough food. Get enough water. (laughs) Got your soul. Most of you have an education or seeking an education. You got hobbies that you enjoy. Talents that you pursue. But now I want you to really look inside of you and find your spirit. If it's not quick... For you to recognize the spirit in you being alive. I would say it's somewhere in a dark corner getting no sunlight, no nutrients. And it's just a shriveled black hole. Seeking God's presence destroys all fear. Seeking God's presence destroys procrastination. Seeking God's presence only gives you confidence, peace, 
joy. Even in the midst of a trial, broken marriage, hit by a car, facing cancer. Right. Even in the midst of those things, and I'm no stranger to trauma, so I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Buried a husband. Seen family go through things, tears us apart. But in the midst of all of it, I have had a peace and an unexplainable joy. Mm -hmm. Amen. Haven't I? Those of you that know me well know it. You know it. And it's not me. But I do have to make a choice. Do I want to be a victim and keep repeating the same boo-hoo mess year after year and not learning my lesson and growing? My spirit will shrivel up and die. So I press in. I seek God's presence. I seek his will, not my own. And I crucify my flesh daily. Does, does that mean that I'm never going to trip up or make a mistake? Absolutely not. But what is important is I have to choose not to live there. Amen. Same with you. I've just given you a whole book full of people who aren't perfect that went on to do great miraculous things that God equipped them for because they pressed in, they repented, they changed their ways, they committed to God. And they're like, unless you're going there, God, I'm not either. Right. I'm not going to go anywhere where you can't come with me. Thank you, Jesus. Your presence is all I need. I know that if I stay in the presence of God, I will be under his umbrella of favor. I won't have to worry about where my house is going to come from. I won't have to worry about provision. I won't have to worry about my children's salvation. Those are just all things that want to rob you of your peace. And trust me, I have many unknown things right now in my life that would drive any woman to go check in at the psych ward. I'm facing a lot of unknowns. So what am I going to do? I could sit, boo-hoo, complain in front of my children about it. Who does that? That's abuse, by the way, if any of you parents do that. Your children should not know your boo-hoo moments. We've got to protect our children. You pour out those things to God and you say, okay, God, I trust you. Let's go. Let's move on. Brush it off. Get up and go. That's what you got to do. It's a choice. Did I get answers? No, I just don't have any answers. I have no clue. I don't know how I'm going to get a house. I don't know what I'm going to be doing for a career years from now. I'm trying to go to college at the same time and raise a family. And it, it's a lot. But you know what? I know that I know that I know that I'm in the will of God right now in my life. No question. And when I made choices to let go of some things I knew I didn't need in my life that were destroying me and holding me back, it was scary in the moment because those things are security blankets for me, for my selfishness. But when I was able to let those things go because I knew it's what God was telling me to do, immediately it was almost like a ray of sunshine where God was just shining on my soul and I literally could feel him say, I'm proud of you. To be in his favor, there's no greater gift, no greater joy. And you can go through the unknowns with this. Joy. I, don't, I, I care, but I can't worry about it. And I can't complain about it. And I can't live there. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And sometimes we can't experience that joy until we let go. You got to let go. Of the fear, of the anxiety, and say, God, it's okay if there are some unknowns right now. I'm in your presence. Hallelujah. In your presence, you. doing your will. Peace is yours today. Let's all stand. Thank you, Jesus. Peace is yours today. You got to let go of the past. You can't move forward if you're living in the past. You got to let go of that. You got to forgive yourself. And if you're facing any decisions right now in your life and you're facing fear, that is not of God. Fear is not of God. It is not of God. Anxiety. 
If there's something you're really wanting to do and you're excited about it, God's given you a passion, you have to be willing to just submit to the Lord and say, God, I'm trusting you. I know you're calling me to do this, and I know that I'm holding myself back. I'm letting go so that you can lead me to the promised land, so that you can lead me to rescuing your people, so that you can lead me into battles, and I win because I have your favor. And the favor belongs to each and every one of you. And the reason I know that is because you were called and you're here today and you listen to this message. You are called to seek his presence. Press in. Don't stop short because you're afraid of what you're going to find in the tomb. Just run on in.